Well, I'm going to minister to not only today, but next Sunday uh, on the subject of righteousness. And pastor wanted me to minister on that. And I'll tell you, when I was at Rama, this class specifically is the one that really messed me up in, in a good way. Uh, I'll never forget the day that I was sitting in class and he read Romans 5, 17, where it says that because of this righteousness that you're going to reign in life. And it was in that moment that that word became alive to me. And I went, wow, I'm supposed to have victory. I'm supposed to be reigning in this life. And I wasn't. And so it was, it was such a good thing for me to, to learn. And I didn't know anything when I was at Ramah, so I learned a whole lot. But remember, Pastor has said, this is the year to reign. Now, if you're going to reign, you've got to understand the subject of righteousness. You've got to understand first that you are made righteous before you can produce fruits of righteousness. And there's a difference. And we're going to talk about that. So I want to read to you a quote by E.W. Kenyon. This is about the word righteousness or the subject. It says, there's no other word in the Bible or in theology which is less understood and appreciated than this word. Yet, enwrapped within it is everything for which humanity has craved. Everything for which humanity has craved. If you will get a clear understanding of righteousness, it will cure all of your guilt, all of your insecurities, all of your fears, anything that holds you back. That's what righteousness is. This is, it is, it's no longer I that live, but it's God that lives in me. And it's not because of anything that I could do on my own accord. And there's too many of us that are still trying to obtain this right position with God. We're trying to, to cover the, the guilt and the failures that we have. I'm telling you, this subject will rid you of all of that. If you'll grasp hold of it, not just listen, but grab a hold of it and act upon it. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 54, and we're going to read verses 14 and 17. We like uh, to say, verse 17, that no weapon formed against us will prosper. But you've got to understand the context of this scripture. In verse 14, it says, in righteousness, you will be established. And that word established means firm, stable, prepared, and furnished. In righteousness, you'll be solid. In righteousness, you'll be prepared, fully furnished. You can stand on solid ground. And because of that, you'll be far from oppression. That is distress, anguish, or unjust gain. Far from it. And you will not fear. That, that is, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to dread anything. Some of us dread going to work. You know, dread is a form of fear. You ought not to dread anything. Some of you checked out right there. <laughs> right there. And from terror, it says, destruction or ruin or alarm, for it shall not come near you. So understand what it's saying in the context here. In righteousness, if you'll understand this subject of who you are, you'll be established and you'll be far from oppression. You'll be far from fear. You'll be far from any kind of ruin or any kind of destruction in your life if you'll understand this righteousness. Now, this is what I want you to get today. There are two kinds of righteousness. God's and your own. And the Bible is very clear about your own and that it as, is as filthy rags before God. But I'm telling you, more than we know it, Many of us believers are still trying to obtain a right position with God. We're still trying to hide and cover our spiritual condition. Let's go to, to uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. 
We don't want to have filthy rags before God. And you know, let me say this while we're going to Matthew 6. In, in Matthew chapter 5, it says, let your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Why does it say that? Because outwardly, they appeared to be righteous. Outwardly, they did everything perfect according to the law. And God called them a, a dead man's tomb and whitewashed tombs. And he's telling us, let the righteousness that I've given you Get in this righteousness because it will far exceed theirs. Don't look like theirs where outwardly you come to church and outwardly you appear right, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. So Matthew 6.33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So it says his righteousness. If it says his, then there could be another right? It's yours. So this, this word righteousness in scripture has two meanings. And one is being righteous, approved by God, accepted before God. And the other one is producing fruits of righteousness. So you cannot just read this scripture and go seek first the kingdom of God and make sure you're doing right things. And all those other things will be added to you. No, you've got to say, seek first the kingdom of God and your position in it. And then all those other things will be added to you. If you look at, at, at the rest of it up above, it says, why are you worrying? Take no thought, zero, no thought for your life. And when it says to take no thought for your life, it says, don't take any anxiety. And not only does it mean that, it means quit trying to do stuff in your own strength. Don't worry about what's going to happen here, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. But no, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and your position in it. You've got to understand that I've been made righteous before you can produce fruits of righteousness. Sometimes we just come to church, we do the works that we think we're supposed to be doing because it makes our conscience feel good. God's saying, no, you get up every single day and you, you look into this perfect law of liberty that sets you free and don't you dare walk away and forget what manner of man that you are. He's made you righteous by the blood of Jesus and through faith alone. It is just you believing that Jesus died and that he rose again. This may seem elementary, but if you don't stay in this every single day, I've taught this subject for years. And if I don't stay in it, the insecurities creep back in. The, the inadequacies try to creep back in. I'm telling you, this subject is the cure for it. God has filled you with everything you need for life and godliness in him, in him. And that's the deal is you got to stay in him. Righteousness is your breastplate. Every single day, you got to put on your armor. And if you look at the armor, righteousness is the breastplate. Why do you think? Because it covers all your vital organs your heart, your lungs, everything that keeps you alive. Righteousness and understanding it is what's going to keep you alive. And if I could just take a side note here, in Ephesians, it talks about how you are seated. This is, we're talking about your position in God. You're seated in heavenly places, far above, right, right with Jesus, far above all rule and authority. And power and dominion, you're, dominion you're, you're seated here. That's where you're at. The, the greatest level of faith is when you're resting in your seat, if I can say that. Resting in your position in God. Far above, it says far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and everything that's named. So uh, lack, cancer, fear doubt, whatever it is, 
The scripture says those things are under your feet. But the problem is, is we get out of our seat and we get down here and try to fix everything ourselves. You got you to gotta surrender fully. Your heart, your life, your thoughts. This is about what you're thinking because inside you've got God fully, the Holy Ghost. But if every day you don't say, I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and the righteous are as bold as a lion, and I can approach the throne of God with boldness, it doesn't matter how you feel. I mean, I woke up with a dream this morning that came out of I don't know where. And I, so I had to get up and go, I'm righteous. Thank you, Father. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You made me right. It's not anything that I could do. I can't get in guilt because of that weird dream I had. A lot of believers live in guilt. Condemnation. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, let's go. Oh, no, I want to read to you a few definitions of righteousness. The first one is, now, write these down if you want to, but I want you to really get them. Restoring to mankind what was lost in the fall. Righteousness is restoring to mankind what was lost in the fall. It is also the life and nature of God in you. The Bible says that he is Jehovah Sidkenu. The Lord Jehovah, our righteousness. He's in you. It is also, this is a big one, the ability to stand before God without the sense of guilt, inferiority, or shame. That's what righteousness is, and I'll say that one again. The ability to stand before God without the sense of guilt, inferiority, or shame, and it is the ability to stand in the Father's presence as though sin had never been. As free as Adam was before he fell. This is your righteous position. Romans chapter 14, verses 17 and 18 says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not those outward things, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is. And you know, in Hebrews, it says, those who are not skilled in this word of righteousness are still babes. But those who are mature are very skilled in this word of righteousness. Why? Because it says by reason of use, they have discerned and trained their senses to see clearly between good and evil. So this is where the battle is, and this is what we'll talk about more next week, is that if we don't train our mind to know that I have full access I have boldness. It's not the power of me. It's the power of God within me. And if you'll train yourself every single day in this righteousness, then you will be as bold as a lion. So the scripture says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is not a religious word, righteousness. This is a legal declaration a legal action that happened in God. It says, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by man. So it's telling you, he who serves Christ in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost is acceptable to God and approved by men. If you don't understand the subject of righteousness, there'll be no peace and joy. If you don't understand who I am and what God has done for me, then you can forget about walking in peace. The Bible says you've been given peace with God. And I'm telling you, a lot of people need to hear that. I'm talking about believers. You've been given peace with God. You're right before him. Quit beating yourself up. Just rise up every day and say, I have been made right because of God, because of what he did. Let's look at what happened. Let's go back to Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28 quickly. 
And it says, verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion or we could say rule or authority or we could say confidence over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful. They first had to know that they were made in his image, right? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. Let me just say this, that the very first thing that the enemy did when he led, when Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, what did he do? He attacked who he was. Or if you really are the Son of God. It's no different for us. If he can't keep you from getting born again, then he'll keep you out of your righteous position. Because if you get born again and you don't stay in this position of who you are, then you will not reign in life. You will not have victory. So this was the position of man. They were naked, not ashamed. There was no guilt. No, nothing. They were in God's image. So we know what happened. They sinned, they fell. And what did Adam do? He sowed fig leaves. Fig leaves just represents religion. Man doing what he can do to cover his spiritual condition. That's all that fig leaves are. And unfortunately, a lot of believers still do that today. Whether it's one thing or another, they're still trying to, to make amends with God, get right with God. And God came down in Genesis 3 and said, no, 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 this is not how it works. I'm going to send the ultimate blood sacrifice to cleanse you from all guilt and all shame and you not understanding who you are. So God came down, made the blood sacrifice, and covered them with skin. And this was the way he, this is how he closed us in Christ. Let's, let's look at it in scripture, what it says. In Genesis 3, 21, it says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. He clothed them. The fig leaves were not it. He said, I'll clothe you. Isaiah 61 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he's clothed me with garments of salvation, and he's covered me with a robe of righteousness. He's clothed you, he's made you righteous. You know, shame is at the root of every single addiction. Every addiction, whether it's alcohol, drugs, pornography, shame is at the root of it. God came to deliver us from this shame. Man has been on this continual search for approval and for significance. Because of Jesus, because of the blood covenant, he's made you right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That you would become that. He made you that. Let's go to, to Romans chapter 3 and we'll start in verse 21. I want to read a few verses down to verse 26. He's declared you just or justified. It says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference, for all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Hallelujah. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just because he is just. And the justifier of the one who has faith in him. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. You'll see in scripture this word imputation. And in in the Old Testament, it says, blessed is the, the man to whom God does not impute sin, but instead imputes righteousness. That word just means a passing from one account to the other. And and this word has a threefold meaning in theology, and it is that when Adam fell, he imputed sin to all man. And then when Jesus died on the cross, all men imputed all of our sin to him. He, He took on all of our sin. But that wasn't enough. Innocence and being sinless is not what gets you in the kingdom of God. In turn, he imputed his righteousness to us. So there's a threefold use of that word. This is not anything that you obtained on your own accord. Thank God for that. If you believe on the Lord Jesus that he died, that he rose again, and that he's imputed this righteousness to you, then you can be right and you can boldly stand before him. Every single day, every single day. Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, it's talking about in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I'll never forget when I was at Ramah, we had to uh, watch a, a movie about Martin Luther. And when I went into this big sanctuary to watch this movie about Martin Luther, I thought they were talking about Martin Luther King Jr., And so I was looking for him on the screen, but all I saw was a monk, uh, this, this man that was a monk, you know, and I was like, who is this guy? This is not Martin Luther. And I would say in the first service, I was a little distracted because my husband was in there too. And I was starting to see him a little bit. Uh, he wasn't my husband yet, but, um, but I was watching this and it was the first time I ever heard of Martin Luther. And I thank God for him because years and years ago, because of the corruption in the church, which still happens today, the corruption in the church where indulgences were sold so that you could get yourself right before God, he read the scripture for himself and said, this is not right. The just shall live by faith. God's made us just. He's made us right. And it's because of the blood that he shed for us. you got to realize the magnitude of this subject and this legal declaration. This is not just an elementary subject. The scripture says this is the meat of the word. Understanding who you are in God. And that you know that because of what he did, he said, all men have sinned. There's not anything you can do on your own. Your own righteousness is filthy rags. But I'm coming. And, I, and he gave his life for you. So that you could every day say, in you, God, I live and I move and I have my being. In you. In God alone, in Christ alone. Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 says, For it pleased the Father 
that in him all the fullness should dwell and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on the earth or things in heaven, listen, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind. And if I can say this, there are still a lot of believers who are alienated and enemies in their mind. And we'll talk more about that next week. You're not estranged from God anymore. You can draw near with confidence and full assurance of faith. The Bible says so. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, listen, holy and blameless, blameless and above reproach in his sight. In other words, there's nothing that he's counting against you. He has forgotten your sins as far as the east is from the west. Sometimes we forget about that. You can stand before him holy and without blame and without insecurity. That'll make you sit up a little straighter. It'll make you confident when you know there's nothing to hide anymore. God's done this for me. I can fully trust, fully trust in him. You have peace through the blood of Jesus. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to read to you verses 1 through about 17. I might skip a few, but we need to hear this. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, that you've been made right. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access. You not only have peace with God now, but you have full access to him. Full access to him by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, So it's saying, not only do you have peace with God, and not only do you have full access, but it says, we also glory in tribulation. We don't like that part. But it says, when we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. We have a lot of hopeless believers. This scripture says that you glory in tribulation. If you'll understand that I have peace with God, I have full access to him, then I can glory in tribulation. Why do you think the scripture says rejoice, brethren? When you face trials of many kinds, you're gonna. You're gonna face trials. You ought to understand that and be very clear about that. Don't think you're gonna walk through this life and not have a trial. So why are we surprised when we have them? Why when they come do we not rejoice? The scripture says rejoice. When you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that why? You're mature and complete, not lacking anything. So you ought to get happy. That's why the scripture says, "Let let the redeemed not the redeemed, let the redeemed say so, but let the, let the righteous rejoice and be glad. Not only that, it says, let them exceedingly rejoice because God's made you right. So next time a trial comes, I'm not talking about a trial comes and you're in church and it's easy for you to rejoice. It's easy for you to get excited. I'm talking about in your daily life. When a trial comes, can you go, well, ha, ha, ha. I'm not moved by this. 
Psalm 55, 22 says, if you'll cast your care on the Lord, your burden, he will not suffer the righteous to be moved. If you understand that you're righteous, then when that trial does come, you can say, I, I'm not moved not one bit. Not one bit by it. And sometimes you just got to put that on by faith. Well, ha, ha, ha. I have the victory. God, you supply all my needs. Every one of them. That's emotionally, spiritually, financially. He meets every single one of your needs. So let's keep reading. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, in other words, we could say how much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now, this next part is the part that, that changed my life at Ramah, but it's also the part that pastor has declared this is the year to reign. From, from this scripture, Romans 5, 17, but we'll start in verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. There's that imputation right there. Death was imputed to all men because of Adam, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. We know the law was given to, as a schoolmaster, the Bible says, or just to show us that we couldn't do it and we needed him. So it says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. Thank God. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Let me say something right here. The Bible says that you either live in the ministry of condemnation or the ministry of righteousness. It is very clear. There is no riding the fence. There is no, I'm going to play with both of them. You live in one or the other. You're still dabbling in your insecurities, your condemnation, your guilt, or you are fully surrendered to this ministry of righteousness, which is the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says that. So if you're living in this ministry of righteousness, then the Holy Ghost himself will lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not yours, but he'll heal you. You know, the, the scripture says that he came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up their wounds. This is this, the just shall live by faith and this righteousness that comes from faith to faith and from glory to glory. If you'll just stay in this ministry of righteousness and just yield to the Holy Ghost, he'll lead you and guide you every single day in the areas of life that you still need healing. He's so good to do that. Just when you think you've arrived and you've gotten through everything, there he'll say, okay, now you're ready for this. Now I got this for you. 
And you just got to say, okay, I'm ready for that, God. I open my heart and I say, you search me, Lord. You know me. You see if there's any offensive way in me. And God, you lead me in the way everlasting. That's what the Holy Ghost does. But we got to get out of this ministry of condemnation. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned. So because of Adam, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Let me say that again, because I don't know if y'all got that. Let me read that again. Much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of right, it's a gift. It's a gift. If you don't receive the gift, then you're not going to fully understand how to walk in fruits of righteousness. You're supposed to yield your members, the scripture says, as members of righteousness and not unrighteousness. But if you don't first understand that God has given you the gift of righteousness, it's who you are. And out of who you are, you'll be who you're supposed to be. So it says, the gift of righteousness, if you've received it, you should be reigning in life. So you've got to take an inventory and say, is there any area of my life that I'm not reigning? Is there any area that I still have insecurity, inadequacy, fear? Remember, in righteousness, you'll be established. You'll be firm. You'll be far from oppression, far from fear. Do you believe that? This is what your righteous position does. Blessed are you, David said, because of this. Let's go to Isaiah 61. Now, this scripture, we've heard this scripture, and we know that this is talking about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Jesus, but it's also talking about you. And in this, it talks about us being trees of righteousness. Isaiah 61, verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he would be glorified. So this is saying the spirit of the Lord God is upon you. He's anointed you and that you're trees of righteousness. And that you're planted. You've got to get your roots planted so that you're not moved and tossed by every wind of doctrine and every trial that comes. I've got my my feet fitted and my roots are planted. And I'm not moved. And and, and this this is what God has done for me. Not anything that I've done on my own. Verse 7 says, instead of your shame, you will have double honor. No more shame. No more shame. No more shame. Instead of your shame, you will have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. You ought to confess this. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. He is just, the scripture says, and he is the justifier of the one who has faith in him. Let's keep reading. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in my God. 
For he has clothed me, we read this a while ago, with garments of salvation. You know that word salvation encompasses everything that you need in Christ? It, one definition means that you're not molested by the enemy anymore. He has clothed you. Every day you got to put your clothes on. Every day, the Bible says, put your clothes on. I remember when I was a little girl and I ran out of the house without my shirt on. And, and it wasn't probably that big a deal, but to me, it was a big deal. And I ran out and realized I didn't have my shirt on and I ran back in the house crying. And that's how we ought to be every day when we leave the house. Do I have my clothes on? Now you ought to be naked spiritually and you can be naked if you're married at times, but you, but you need to be fully clothed in Christ, in God, with the helmet of salvation on, with the breastplate of righteousness on, with your belt of truth buckled around your waist, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of peace. And the scripture says, because of that, you can extinguish with your shield of faith every single one of the fiery darts of the evil one. He's shooting them, and he will not quit. He's not going to stop. The Bible says you have authority. He's under your feet. If I'll just stay in my seated position far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, then I have authority over him. He's under my feet. I will greatly rejoice. You ought to rejoice in the Lord about this righteousness. My soul will be joyful in my God. Can I say this? You have got to get this. This is how you overcome in life. If you don't listen to anything else, listen to me right now. This is how you have the victory. Is it every day? When that thing, that thought process comes, that insecurity comes, you say, oh no, I've been given and gifted the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm right before him. I'm fully clothed. I'm complete in Christ. God is in me. The Holy Ghost is in me. I'm the healed of the Lord. I've been delivered. I've been sanctified. I'll rejoice. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Quit responding to how you feel. My God, if the world can do that, we ought to be way better than them. We ought to be the ones that have victory. That we can walk through death, life. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, it's just a shadow. It's not even death. Nothing can take you out. Because if you go out of this world, you're going to be with God. It's just a shadow. I'm not moved by the shadow. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will not fear. I will not fear evil. The Bible says you're seated at the table. Stay seated. Stay seated. I'll never forget uh, listening to that when I was at Ramah about being seated at the table. And, and uh, Brother Hagen began to say, and he was getting excited, pass me the bowl of victory. Pass me the bowl of joy. Pass me a little, give me a little healing. And he was saying all that. I had just pulled up at my little apartment in my little car, and he started going off, and he said, the enemies are there. They're there. And they're talking. But I said, oh, you just go ahead and pass me the joy. You go ahead and pass me my victory. And I got out of my car. I'm not kidding. I got out of my car and I ran down the street in the pitch dark because I got the victory. You got to get the victory. Nobody can get the victory for you. Nobody can. You've got to get it yourself. It doesn't matter how stirred up I am. If you're not stirred up yourself, if you don't stir yourself up in your most holy faith, then you're not going to walk in this victory and this righteousness. Okay. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and he's covered me 
with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations." righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Psalm 92, verse 12 through 15. It says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bring forth fruit in old age and they'll be fat and flourishing. I love that. That's not talking about physical fatness, but that's talking about fat spiritually. And I remember when someone spoke this over me when I was new in the Lord, this Psalm 92, and it's been a word of God for me when I felt like I was gonna die, basically, that God, you said in my old age, I'm still gonna bear fruit. God, you said, God, you said, you know, he says to keep him in remembrance of his word, not because he forgot it. He didn't forget it, but you've got to keep him in remit. Keep it before you keep it before him. God, you said, I remember when I had a miscarriage and I went before God and said, God, you said, you said the fruit of my womb would be blessed, would be blessed to show that the Lord is upright, or he is righteous, he is just. He is my rock, and there's no unrighteousness in him. None. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 says, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, not having my own but his. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This subject is huge for you, for you to live this thing out. And next week, we'll talk about Romans chapter one a little bit more in depth of how it says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. And what happened because of it? And why many churches in our world look like they do today. Let me read Hebrews chapter five, verses 12 through 14. It says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk, I mentioned this to you, they are unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We will talk more about that, about discerning and understanding this in your mind. Let's go to Psalms chapter 112, and we'll end with this. Psalms 112. I'll start in verse one. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth, 
and the generation of the upright will be blessed. You know, that's upright, that's you, the righteous, the just. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. Wealth and riches will be in your house and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright, or we can say unto the righteous, there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends, and he will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be an everlasting remembrance. He will not, this is you, he will not be afraid of evil tidings or evil report. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. Remember, in righteousness, you will be established. His heart is established, and he will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed abroad and he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever and his horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and grieve and he will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. But the righteous, the scripture says, will have wealth and riches in your house. And that instead of shame, you'll have double honor and that God will never allow the righteous to be moved, to be shaken. Malachi 4.2 says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. This righteousness will heal and cure every insecurity, every guilt, every sense of shame and inadequacy. And that's why in Psalm 68, it says, let the righteous be glad and let them rejoice exceedingly. Let them rejoice before God. Only Christ can make you righteous. And if you've been made righteous in God, you've got to remind yourself daily that this is a gift and it's not anything that I could earn on my own. Coming to church doesn't make you righteous. Doing what you feel like makes you feel good before God is not what makes you righteous. It's only believing by faith. That's why Abraham was declared righteous because not only did he believe God, but he acted on his word. And because of that, and Jesus hadn't even risen from the grave yet, God declared him righteous. And it's the same with you when you believe on him, he makes you righteous. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, you can be as bold as a lion and have peace with God and have full access to him. 